So today, I've titled today's message, message, God has chosen you. God has chosen you. And we're going to be reading a short passage at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Many of you are familiar with it. Um, and I, decide, I decided to, to, to pick that particular passage because, again, I think that we, as I mentioned when I was last here, we sometimes forget Sometimes uh, we sometimes we get the basics and we are so overwhelmed and we're thinking about so many other things that, you know, we forget that we're chosen. God has specifically chosen each and every one of you. I believe there, if I'm not mistaken, about three billion people in this planet, around roughly three billion more or less. And um, if you think about it, God saved you. Well, all those billions of people, not just are living today, but that have lived since God created man, you know, he saved you. He's called you. You know, that we, we live in a world right now where wrong is right, right is wrong, where evil is good, good is evil, and we... You know, these people, we're surrounded by voices and people telling us that we're stupid because of our faith. We're stupid for believing in Jesus and the crucifixion, and, and um, we're mocked and made fun of, and we're called foolish. And, you know, so today, you know, I just want to get back to that place and say, hey, you know what, really, the cross is foolishness to those who just don't get it. But to those of us that do, we're privileged. We are, we're blessed that God has revealed his wisdom to us. And so that's what I'm going to be focusing on today and, and just encouraging you, encouraging you that if you feel like an outsider, you feel like a nobody, you feel like a loser, you feel like a failure, because <clears throat> that's how the world is making you feel. Just remember, God has specifically chosen you. And in his eyes, you're not. You're special. <clears throat> so that's where we're going to be at, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And, and I'll be reading from verses 26 to 31. So before I begin reading, let's pray and thank God. God, for just allowing us to be here this morning. Uh, Lord Jesus, um, Lord God, Father, God in heaven, we are so thankful that you've brought us here. We're so thankful that you have given us another day to, to breathe the air that you created, to enjoy the voices and embraces of our love, of those that we love. are so thankful that you've given us life. You've given us eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ. So now as we dig deep into your word, I pray that the words that we're about to read, may they come alive. May they just really be implanted deep in our hearts so that we may hear from you personally and corporately as a church, Lord. We're, we know that you have a message here for us, so we eagerly await that. Lord, use me as your instrument tool just calm the, the nerves and anxieties of those who are maybe feeling anxious and worried and about things that are outside these walls. And right now, may they just give them that peace. Just focus on what you have to say today. So we can fill this room, Lord, with your spirit. Open our hearts and minds now. Bless those watching and listening. 
may they be blessed as well. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Previous to this passage that I just read, that we just read together, Paul had just finished making the claim that uh, that the apparent foolishness of the message of Christ crucified, it, it revealed the extent, the vastness of God's wisdom. See, what he was explaining was that for both Jews and Gentiles, the cross of Christ was just something that they couldn't wrap their heads around. They, it was way over their head or it, it was just something they, they couldn't mentally grasp. Humanity's Savior hanging on a cross became a stumbling block for the Jew or it was just too simple for the Greek intellectuals. However, now, Paul also realized, was aware that uh, there was also a big problem in the church at Corinth. You see, later on in chapter 4, it's revealed that the believers there had a tendency to be puffed up with pride. But here's the thing. The gospel of God's grace leaves no room for personal boasting. God isn't impressed with our looks, our social position, our achievements, our national heritage, or our financial status. And so Paul, he wanted them to see how foolish this was in light of the divine wisdom and power and how inconsistent status-seeking and how inconsistent status-seeking is with the gospel. First, Paul challenges his readers to take, to take a good look around the church, to note who wasn't present among them. And this he did in verses 18 through 25. You see, glaringly absent from the church are those people who held positions of status in the secular world in accordance with secular values. See, church, the, the church, whether it's this one here or just the church in in general, meaning all believers, it isn't really made up fully of intellectuals, social influencers, or the rich and famous celebrities. It's not. It's made of just ordinary people for the most part. Now, in verses 26 to 31, Paul wants the Corinthians to give thought 
to those present in the church. Look at yourselves, Paul challenged the Corinthians, granting the possibility of a few exceptions. Paul reminds the Corinthians of the rule that for the most part, the church, again, isn't composed of the wise or the powerful or the noble when judged by fleshly, unbelieving standards. Instead, God has chosen to save the foolish, the weak, the insignificant, and the despised, the nobodies. The word chosen in verse 27 is very significant because it underscores that God chose those on the lowest rung of the social ladder. It wasn't that these were all that would come to God. It's that these are those whom God ordained to come to Him. And it wasn't that God couldn't do any better. It was that God chose not to do better. Following the principle set set down in verse 19, Paul explains why God selected the undesirables of this world for salvation. God has purposed to nullify the wisdom of the wise and to humble the proud. He has chosen to do this by employing means and people that the world rejects as weak and foolish and worthless. God hasn't done this because the weak and foolish are any better than the powerful and the proud. He has set aside the highly regarded and employed or used those things which are disdained so that all the glory might come to himself and not to anybody else, not to mere man. This, that there is the concluding point Paul makes in verses 29 through 31. If God were to achieve his purpose, his purposes through the worldly, through those that the world considers wise and powerful, we would be inclined to give the praise and glory to the men he has used rather than to God. This world believes the shakers and the movers, the influencers are the ones who make things happen. Even the church seeks to evangelize and train those whom the world regards as most likely to succeed. But God, our God in heaven, chooses the opposite. Those whom we'd expect to fail, or more accurately, those we already deem to be failures, the losers of this world. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that God sees Christians as losers. He doesn't look at you as a failure. No, that's not what I'm saying. Rather, when God calls people to his family, he intentionally chooses those whom the world rejects. He prefers the weak over the strong, the forgotten over the famous, and the nobodies over the somebodies. He starts with the people the world chooses last and actually prefers to choose the weak instead of the strong. Now, let me give you a mental illustration. Imagine a group of children who are about to pick sides for a game of kickball. And if 
For those of you old enough, you know what I'm talking about. You guys played that game before. And we know what that's like to line up against the fence and wait to be chosen. Typically, the best two players, the athletes are selected as captains. And they, in turn, uh, and they, like, each take turns picking the best players that they possibly can for their teams. But just suppose those two who are always picked last are given the chance to be captains. Suppose the game unfolds as an exercise of having fun, not just winning the game. Suppose the teams are delighted in having captains who can't kick or field well, but love to play the game. And that love, that excitement, it becomes infectious. It won't happen, huh? Never, probably won't ever happen. Because you see in a world of team sports, and I get it, you know, I'm enjoying the World Cup games going on right now. Been watching, for the most part, all of them, waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning and <laughs> watching the games, some of the games. Um, but in the world of team sports, even whether it's at a playground level or at a professional level, we want to cheer. And we want to go for those who will perform. Those who are the stars, the Ronaldos, the Messis, you know, just those superstars. That's who we want to go for. That's who we want to cheer for, whether or not that's the country that you're rooting for. You still want to see them, you know, dribble the ball and, you know, make that, make that amazing goal. But guess what? Here's what I'm trying to say. God, our God, loves to pick the ones picked last. Again, in verses 27 and 28, Paul reminds the Christians at Corinth of why God chose them. Now, let me read to you those two verses in the New Living Translation. God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. And he chose the things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. Now let me give you an illustration, another illustration of what that means. When the world throws a party, and what I mean by the world... Uh, you know, the famous, the rich and famous celebrities, the, pu the beautiful people are always invited. Ran a nightclub, hire a security team to keep the ordinary people out. Only the in crowd makes it past the rope line. Helicopters are flying overhead and the paparazzi or Anybody with a, a phone, they're out there taking pictures, hoping that they'd get that special one and they'd, be, they'd take that, that either embarrassing moment or that special moment that, so they can be the first ones to post it in their social media. You see, it's all about who shows up and who's wearing what kind of dress and trying to match this man with that woman. That's how the world throws a party. But God does it differently. God chooses those that have nothing to brag about. God chooses people that no one at all would invite to a party. He includes those who would normally be excluded. 
And why does he do this? Why does God do it this way? So that he can subvert, invert, and convert human values. Let me repeat that. He does this. He includes those who would normally be excluded so that he can subvert, invert, and convert human values. He does this to shame the wise, the strong, and to bring them to nothing the things that are impressive to our world. Why does God choose? Why does God uh, choose to have um, choose those people, those things? Um, well, why does he have? Uh, why does he choose those people? Well, verse 29 answers it. So that no one, no one may boast in his presence. In other words, God determined to choose despised ones, those who embrace the foolishness of the cross, so that no one can boast about his or her human accomplishment or position in his presence. It doesn't matter if you're wearing all the garbs of a priest, some ordained minister. He doesn't care about titles. He doesn't care about all the degrees you may have all the positions you may have held. He doesn't care about that. He cares about just you, each and every single one of you. He cares about your heart. He cares about your mind. He cares about every single part of you. You may look at yourself and say, I'm nothing. I'm insignificant. I'm just a simple woman. I'm just a simple man. Never been good at anything. Never been an overachiever. No one likes to take my picture. No one likes to invite me anywhere. Here's the thing. God looks at you and says, that's my child. That's my daughter. That's my son. He's proud. Yeah, like any other parent, like kind of, well, sort of. Again, he's higher and better than any of us that are parents, but when we obey, when we listen and hear him, and he's proud. He's like, that's my, that's my child. And when we disobey, sometimes he will chastise us. But he does it all in love. Remember that. It doesn't matter what the world thinks of you, says about you. It doesn't matter what that coworker says, what that family says. Maybe you experienced that this Thanksgiving, you were with some family, and they, maybe they called you stupid for being a believer, for being a Christian. They, they mock you for, they tell you because you believe in old wives' tales, and, you know, and they're trying to tell you, okay, come on, get with the program. We live in a different day and age. You know, all that foolishness. when you try to explain the gospel, when you try to explain, they're like, nah, I don't, it, does, it doesn't click. It doesn't, they don't get it. It's easy, simple for you to understand. God has revealed it to you. And one day, hopefully, your prayers will be answered and they'll get it too. They'll understand it. God will reveal it to them too.
And then they'll get to a point where maybe you were at and say, I can't believe how stupid I was for believing those things and mocking Christians. And, you know, you just, you understand what the, what the cross is, what it means, what it represents, what it did for you. Don't worry about what others are saying. What others think of you. What ought to matter to you is how God sees you now, covered by the blood of Jesus. Now have this special relationship with God that so many people, so many people are yearning for, that have a deep down, empty hole in their hearts that are looking for so many, th- they've been trying to fill it with so many things and yet they haven't been able to find it. But you have. God has filled your heart now. Don't give up praying for those family members. God called you. He called me. I really believe he can call anybody. Anybody. Where was I? Um... Give me a second. I lost my place here. Um, okay. So why does God choose those that have nothing? Okay. Uh, he ans- Paul answers in verse 29, so that no one may boast in his presence. Um, God wants believers to constantly recognize that they have nothing to brag about before him. Rather, they're completely completely 100% indebted to him. And finally, again, going over this just a little bit more, verses 30 and 31, Paul reminds believers of all they had in Jesus. In Christ, believers, if you consider yourself, if you are a believer today, you possess the wisdom of God, and have received all the benefits that come from the cross. And he states three of them here. Believers have been given God's righteousness, meaning they've been made right with him, right with themselves, and right with other people. Believers have received sanctification meaning they've been set apart and made holy, both positionally and practically. And believers have received God's redemption, meaning God, through Christ, has purchased the believer from the power of sin. Those are the three benefits. You've been given God's righteousness, You've received God's sanctification, and you've received God's redemption. Therefore, because of those benefits, my friends, Christians, believers, you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, can properly boast. Not of your own achievements, but in the Lord. Paul references Jeremiah chapter 9 verses 23 and 24, to show that those who have nothing to brag can boldly brag about what God did for them on the cross. And here's the thing, church. If you've ever wondered what kind of people God chooses to be part of His family, these verses here, answer that question. If, if you ever wondered why God, why did God choose me? These verses help answer that question. I have no doubt if 
you're anything like me or you're just a human being, maybe some of you have struggled with those thoughts of feeling insignificant, feeling unimportant, feeling like a loser, feeling like a failure, maybe feeling that God couldn't possibly choose you. Maybe some of you, again, have wrestled those feelings. If so, let me point out to you what, again, what verses 26 to 31, what they say about the sort of people God chooses. God intentionally, He intentionally chooses the losers of the world. Those that the world just considers unimportant. Don't mis- again, don't misunderstand me. The kind of losers I'm talking about isn't the kind of loser someone calls another person to put them down. The losers I'm talking about are those who've been rejected by the world. Those who have lost promotions, those who have lost relationships, those who have lost so many things because of your faith, because of who you've placed your faith in. They call you a loser for that, but really, you're not. You are redeemed. My friends, you are redeemed. The world may reject you, The world may not want anything to do with you. God has a specific plan and purpose for you. And that plan is beautiful. It's wonderful. He will bring it to fruition. You just continue to walk with him. In the good times and in the bad. During those days when you're healthy, And those days, those times, those seasons when you're sick. I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago when I was here. God isn't done with you. God won't be done with any of you until you breathe your last. And that's when your race is finished. That's the race has been complete. And hopefully you'll be able to say what Paul says that I've I ran my race well. I hope that when that day comes I'll be able to to say that. That if there's any boasting, it's again boasting to the Lord. That it's He, it's everything I have, everything I've been given, everything I've been blessed with has all been him. and He doesn't see me as a loser. God deliberately chooses the forgotten of the world and he prefers the company of the poor. He loves to save the uneducated, the foolish, the addicted, the broken, the downcast, the imprisoned. Those at the bottom of the barrel, those who have reached their wit's end, the end of the rope, those are the people he loves to save because they have nowhere else to go. And either, and I've been there, either they will choose to continue that path of destruction or choose to reach out for his outstretched hand. He chooses you. Remember you, like I'm asking you to remember where you were, where your life was, or what, where, what, what was going on in your life when God called you. 
you were probably, maybe you were at the bottom of your barrel, at the bottom of the barrel, too. And you reached out to him and he rescued you. Maybe things didn't turn out as perfectly as you wanted them to turn out, but you know that there's a much greater reward waiting for you, something far more better waiting for you, and you're satisfied with that. He has chosen you. So don't feel bad if you don't have a doctorate degree in theology. If you feel like you're not the smartest person, consider Moses. He's, he's like, I can't talk. You know, I don't have words. I can't talk to Pharaoh. Think of all the people he used, all the stories. He used Peter, he used Matthew. He used, look at the women he used. They were nothing. He saw them. Remember that story with the woman who, was, who brought the jar of perfume. She came, she started you know, pouring this, this perfume on Jesus' feet and everyone. It's like, what is this? What's she doing? Even Judas, one of his disciples, was like, man, that money could be used to, <coughs> excuse me, that money could be used to help the poor. But Jesus knew what she was doing. And for him, that was the most precious and valuable thing. Everybody else was doing their own thing, but this woman, she was, it wasn't about the perfume, it was just her heart. She was pouring her heart out to him. And that's what Jesus considered valuable. So are you pouring your heart out to him? Are you broken? Come to him and he will restore you. Again, he loves to save those people. In short, again, he specializes in saving those whom the world counts as nothing. A simple, uneducated, untalented, and clumsy believer. Who would I just describe? Hopefully... I know I am one of those, I'm probably the most clumsy, clumsiest person. Um, but a clumsy, uneducated, untalented, and clumsy believer who has trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior and who faithfully and humbly follows his Lord is immeasurably wiser than the brilliant PhD who scoffs at the gospel. The simple believer knows forgiveness, love, grace, life, hope. The unbelieving PhD, on the other hand, knows nothing beyond his books, his mind, and his experiences. God chooses those that have nothing to brag about. Everybody who's somebody in the world typically has something to brag about. The wealthy tend to brag about how much money they have. Politicians tend to brag about what they've done, or what they plan to do. Entertainers and musicians tend to brag about their popularity, all they've accomplished, their um, platinum records, the stadiums they filled, the partying they've done. And the religious people often tend to brag about all the things they've done for God. Oh, yeah, 
I serve at the church, and I do this, and I do that, and, you know, I'm, you know, I'm one of their highest ranking elders or leaders in the church, and, man, pretty soon I'm going to take over the pastor's job. (laughs) Those are the religious ones. They boast about themselves. God, however, as I've been talking about, prefers to call those who don't have any of these things to brag about so that the one who boasts boast in the Lord. So as God continues to transform you into the image of Christ, your life will echo the words written in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. I'll never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. God chooses those that have plenty of sin and weakness. As I said a minute ago, the Bible is full of stories of how God chose adulterers, conmen, prostitutes, murderers, thieves, and the physically disabled to do great things for him. This ought to convince you that if he chose them, nothing you've done in your past will keep him from choosing you. And so why does God choose people like you and me? Because of his love and for his glory. To be a blessing to others and to share the love he's given you with those around you. See, God chooses people who once had messed up lives to show others who currently have messed up lives that that in Jesus Christ, there's redemption, forgiveness, hope, and peace, which again is something so many people are looking for, are searching for, yearning for. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, Paul wrote, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. My friends, God can and will use you in spite of your past. You just have to be willing. You just have to be willing and say, yes, Lord, use me. Friends, the gospel is incompatible with human pride. When saints strive uh, with other saints out of pride, the cure isn't to enhance their pride. The cure isn't to enhance their pride, to improve their self-esteem. It's to remove that pride. The self-esteem of the saints doesn't need to be commended. It shouldn't even be criticized. It needs to be crucified. Your self-esteem, your self-worth, it needs to be crucified. Do you ever wonder why our Lord instructed His church to remember His suffering and death by observing the Lord's table to, you know, when we observe communion? You shouldn't. Communion is a commemoration of the work of Christ, the gospel. Communion isn't simply a remembrance of an act which our Lord accomplished in the past. It's a way of life which we are to emulate every single day of our lives. How often, when men seek to evangelize the lost 
or when they attempt to motivate Christians and unbelievers to give or to serve. But in all reality, what they're doing is appealing to human pride. They glorify certain tasks and positions so that people will fill them for that glory. They publicly laud the gifts of service or service of people so that they will be proud of their contribution. Gospel thinking requires us to do just the opposite. In order to be saved, we must confess our sin and admit that we are unworthy of God's gift of salvation. We must humble ourselves and accept the free gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. We must cease trusting in our goodness, in our work or efforts, in our worthiness, and cast ourselves on the sinless Son of God who died in our place, bearing the penalty of our sin and giving us and giving to us His righteousness as a free gift. The gospel which saves is the gospel which humbles. And that humbling gospel is the basis for Christian unity and harmony. So now I ask those watching and listening to this message, if you've never accepted the gospel message and the free gift of salvation in Christ of which the gospel speaks, I want to invite you to do that today. I want to invite you to the cross and lay your sins for Jesus and ask him to forgive you. And he will. He will forgive you. He will save you. He will redeem you. He will free you. And he will fill that hole that you have as I said a minute ago, you tried to fill up with so many different things. He will finally fill it with his love, his grace, his mercy, his peace. Why? Because that's what he did. That's why he went to the cross to forgive you. So if you're ready to do that, you're ready to, to be redeemed, you're ready to be forgiven. You're ready to be a child of God. I want you to, wherever you're at, if you're somewhere safe, if you're somewhere where you can close your eyes and and, and bow your head, I want you to do that. And uh, I want to lead you in a prayer. And you can repeat these words after me. But speak them with a sincere heart like you really mean it say them like you mean it not like you mean it but say them say them with all sincerity the Lord knows your heart if you've blown it if you messed up he will forgive you so let me lead you in that prayer if you're ready to do that just repeat these words Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I'm sorry. Sorry, Lord. I believe now with all my heart that you died for my sins and that three days later you rose from the dead. So now I turn from my sins. I repent and confess you, Jesus, as my Lord, my personal Lord and Savior. 
thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. And now, Lord, I ask you to fill me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.